SciTech Expo. Day five, we've made it to Friday, everybody. What an exciting week of programming that we've had. Uh, if you've tuned into more than one of our virtual SciTech Triangle Expo. SciTech Day. Expo programs, drop a note in the chat, say hello, and then maybe what other programs you've tuned into. If this is your first one, thanks for joining us. I think you picked a good one because today we're going to be talking about some very, very cool animals, which we keep in care for at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So thanks for being here, everybody. We're going to get started in just a second. I'll go through a quick look at how to use Zoom in case this is your first time here, and then we'll jump into our program. All right. So everybody, welcome once again. Glad you're all here. It looks like we're all in. Looks like we're situated. So very quickly, my name is Chris. I'll be your host for this program today. If you're watching here on Zoom, make sure that you use the chat box in order to drop your questions, comments, and experiences as we go along. If you're watching with us over on YouTube, you have access to the chat as well. Same thing, let us know your questions as we go through the programs. As they pop into your brain, you can type them out onto your keyboard and we'll make sure to pose those questions to today's very special guest about some very special critters. Now, if you're watching on Zoom, you're seeing a screen that looks a little something like this with the window boxes and the program will begin slide. Want everybody to know that you have access to closed captions on the bottom of the screen, just click the button that says close caption and then click show subtitle. For the best viewing experience here on Zoom, go up into the top right and click speaker view or click that button, it may say gallery view, and change it to speaker view to make sure that you're seeing our guests as they present and you can see what they're sharing as we go along. Uh, for today's, I'm not sure we're going to be doing much screen sharing, so make sure that you keep your screen nice and big so that you can see the animals up close. Click the button at the bottom of the screen where it says chat in order to bring up the chat, and that's where you can leave your questions, comments as we go through. I'll ask everybody to please leave their videos off and leave yourself muted throughout the program because we want to make sure everybody gets the best look at today's animals as we can. And that is the show. At least that's my part of it. Let me introduce today's very special guests. Kurt Friga is the curator of reptiles, amphibians, and ambassador animals at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And he's got some very cool animals to show and tell today. Hey, Kurt, how's it going? It's going great. Um, so, yeah, like Chris said, I... I take care of a lot of the uh, reptiles and amphibians here at the museum, and that includes uh, some of our uh, potentially dangerous uh, reptiles that we keep here. So right now, we're in the room of the museum where we keep all of our venomous reptiles. Uh, we keep a lot of our native pit vipers, and we also keep two species of venomous lizard, uh, the Mexican beaded lizard, and the Gila monster. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about mostly today, as uh, those are, uh, the Gila monster in particular is an animal that uh, there's been some really cool recent therapeutic developments that have come out of uh, their venom profile. And venom is kind of an interesting thing that we are just uh, in the last couple of decades, really starting to discover the therapeutic benefits that can come out of uh, venom research. And that's led to a lot of really cool pharmaceutical developments uh, in recent years. Uh, but I'd like to show you around a little bit just so we can uh, see what we've got back here. So, so yeah, real yeah. quick, Kurt, can you give us a sense of where you're at in the museum? This yeah. isn't someplace that visitors would see on a regular trip. 
Yeah, unfortunately not. Uh, this is an area that for obvious reasons, uh, there's not a lot of public traffic through this room. But right now we are behind the snake exhibit on the third floor of the Nature Exploration Center. So if you were coming to see our native snakes, uh, where our rattlesnakes and uh, some of our other non-venomous snakes are, this is the area behind that exhibit. And this is arranged this way so we can safely work those animals, uh, feed them, clean them, move them, do whatever we need to do without ever doing that on the floor uh, where the public is. So all of these exhibits, uh, this is a copperhead right here, uh, they're in self-contained exhibits that pull right up to the wall uh, where there is a second pane of glass, and then we can remove them and do whatever we need to do. And there's tons of room back here where we can move things around and uh, manipulate things safely. Uh, and what I like to tell people is when it's done right, working with venomous animals or dangerous animals can be pretty boring to watch. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of showmanship that goes into uh, the things you might see on TV that really isn't safe for the animal or safe for the keeper. And we do our best to avoid that. Uh, we use tools for, for most of our handling, especially with the uh, venomous snakes. We always have a buddy system. Uh, Shauna, who you can't see right now, who's working the camera, one of our other curators. Uh, we have two people back here whenever we're opening a venomous exhibit, uh, just in case something were to happen. We drill uh, envenomations with these animals annually to make sure everybody's up to date on the protocol. Uh, and we do a lot of training just to make sure we know what we're doing. Everything's very slow, deliberate. Uh, there's no head pinning and yelling and running around uh, kind of stuff that uh, you might expect to see from, from more you know, sensationalized stuff on, on the TV. Uh, so thing, thank you. I want to talk a little bit um, about venom because we're going to go ahead and feed these guys so we can uh, show you guys how we do husbandry and feeding back here. Uh, venom is kind of a he was hiding in his log. Sorry about that. <laughs> so venom is uh, one of those things that uh, people tend to not understand terribly well. It's people want to look at it as this uh, single substance that does one thing. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, venom is modified saliva. It's this complicated cocktail of enzymes and proteins and uh, different factors that help that animal either catch prey, defend itself, or digest prey, or some combination of the three. Uh, and if they don't have that venom, if they can't produce that venom, they're at a severe disadvantage. Uh, so venom is really costly produced for the animal, and it's something that uh, is really valuable to them. If they can avoid it, uh, they're not going to spend it. So these guys, um, these are Gila monsters. Uh, their range kind of extends through uh, mostly through the western part of Arizona, goes up a little bit into uh, Utah, and the southern tip of it is kind of just getting into Mexico. Uh, these guys, so they are venomous, but they are not, their venom and the way they deliver their venom is very different from, say, a uh, copperhead you might encounter in North Carolina that has a big venom gland in its head, it has a muscular apparatus that kind of squeezes that gland when it injects its prey, and a tubular fang uh, that uh, it uses to deliver that. These guys, it's a little bit different. So you can kind of see they have these big fat cheeks um, and
Oh, it looks like we may have lost them. Let me know in the chat, everybody, if I just lost them or if you lost them too. We did lose them. Yeah, they are behind the scenes at the museum, uh, in, hanging out in some of those special places. So there are dead zones in the Wi-Fi around the museum. So I'm sure we'll get them back in just a moment and we'll work on uh, making sure that happens. So Carrie, yeah, how cool are these Gila monsters? One, they're gorgeous. I love that peachy color that they've got. So you're asking me? <laughs> I was asking to jump, you, in a, yes. to ask, jump into a Gila monster program. Well, I'll share the small amount I know about Gila monsters. Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, their color to me, um, and I'm kind of guessing here, so I'm not 100% sure, but it seems like mm -hmm. the coloration, that gorgeous coloration that they have is more of a warning. You know, like so a lot of venomous animals will have that that warning so people, you know, people or other animals, predators know that that is a venomous animal. Um, but they are really cool. Sure, yeah. So they're reptiles and a lot of reptiles like alligators, we're familiar with that, have, um, have osteoderms. So we were talking about this last night with our science words is sometimes you can tell what a word means looking at its roots. So osteo means bone, like um, and then derm, like dermatitis, means skin. So they have bones in their skin. Um, so it's like they have armor. And so they, uh, the Gila monsters, what is so cool about them, and when I educate with them, we have a bone clone that actually shows their skull. And their osteoderms are fused to their cranium. So when you actually look at a Gila monster's skull, it's all bumpy and it looks kind of crazy. You know, mostly we're used to seeing smooth skulls, right? Like all the, that stuff's on the outside. So, um, but that is really cool. And then the other cool thing um, is what, you know, Kurt was telling us about their venom is a lot different mm -hmm. than something like a snake that has a very sophisticated method of delivering venom. Um, Gila monsters aren't quite so sophisticated. They have the venom glands, which as Kurt said, is just a modified saliva. Um, but instead of having these, um, you know, our venomous snakes, especially our pit vipers um, or vipers in general, have they're like hypodermic needles. Like if you think about plunging the plunger down in a needle and it's squirting out, that's what their fangs are like. Gila monsters do not have that. Their venom essentially flows from their glands, which is in their lower jaw, into their mouth, and they have grooves in their awesomely recurved teeth. And uh, the venom flows into those grooves and then into the wound that the teeth is making into whatever it wants to envenomate. And so it's very, very cool. So it has to actually chew on its prey in order to work that venom into the wound. And so there's been some pretty famous quotes from naturalists over the years that you have to try really, really, really hard to get envenomated by a Gila monster <laughs> um, because they're just not, you know, they're not fast they're not certainly not um, <laughs> going to chase you. Um, you know, snakes, you know, strike so rapidly. Gila monsters, you know, I think that the, there has been, I think there's like one recorded death, if I'm remembering correctly. And I think it was somebody who was intoxicated um, and mm. essentially passed out and couldn't, <laughs> did not get away <laughs> from the Gila monster. And I assume he was um, harassing the Gila monster before he got envenomated. So it's always a good guess. Um, so Hugo says uh, they're at the back of the snake exhibits. Oh, so what species of snakes we have? So North Carolina has, um, I think, oh, they're back. So I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for filling in for us. <laughs> we got, we got someone eating right here. Welcome back, Kurt. Hi, Shana. Hey. Thanks. So, I, I, so we were able to hear uh, everything you guys were talking about, and I'll, I'll go ahead and just jump in and elaborate on some of that stuff. Uh, Please do. So talking about these guys, Venom, uh, it's kind of interesting because the way these guys uh, hunt in the wild, they have a really, really cool strategy. They're 
they live in an area where there's not a lot of food availability and the food availability is a pretty limited time of year. They're going to emerge from uh, their little dens or burrows uh, in the spring and they need to consume as much food as possible in a very short window when there's ground nesting birds and things like that. So the food that they're consuming is mostly eggs, uh, little baby chicks, things that they don't really need to work that hard to catch. So the current school of thought is that their venom is not really that important for food capture, uh, especially considering that a bite from one of these animals is super, super painful. Uh, so the thought is that their venom is one that's used more for defense than it is for prey capture. It's also, uh, because they have that strategy, <laughs> he's going in again, uh, they're very deliberate eaters. This is gonna be happening for the next like 30 minutes. So when they do come across food in the wild, they might eat three or four meals uh, in a year in that very short window. And they're very, very efficient at storing that energy. You can see their big fatty tail where they can kind of deposit all of that. And they're also really, really good at eating super large meals uh, at one time. One of these animals can consume a meal that's more than 50% of its body weight at any given time and be okay with that because they might come across something and need to just eat all of it because who knows when they're going to see food again. So one of the components of their venom, uh, extendin-4, that kind of regulates the absorption of glucose is what researchers have been able to synthesize in a laboratory setting to produce a drug that regulates insulin uh, release in humans. Uh, it's, I believe it's marketed under the name Trulicity. Uh, so that's a thing where we typically venom research in animals has begun because people were trying to figure out how to combat envenomation in humans or how to treat a bite to humans. And the more researchers looked into that, the more they were able to see that there's a lot of very specific components to these venoms that can help people in other ways, uh, that are very good at targeting specific kinds of cells um, or regulating a specific action in, uh, in that animal's physiology. Yeah, we're going to go over to this side. So, Craig, did you say that they'll eat three or four meals a year? Uh, they In the wild, they could absolutely do that. They could subsist off of very few meals, and they would be very large meals, and then they're very, very efficient at packing away that energy and uh, holding on to it for a very long time. They also don't need to consume a lot of water in the wild. Uh, they're really good at getting a lot of that uh, hydration from the food that they consume and storing that. Uh, their skin is also surprisingly permeable for being as you know knobby and rough looking as it is. They can pull in uh, some of that moisture that they might get if they burrow down into a wet area or if there's like a rainier season. But they don't need to consume that few meals to get by, which is if you live in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, that is very, very beneficial. Uh, here in captivity, we feed them a little bit more regularly. Uh, so our, our lizards eat uh, pretty much weekly. Uh, but we do much smaller meals than they would probably get in the wild. And that's something we sort of monitor closely uh, along with our vets who manage our uh, nutrition program. Uh, they would get annual exams. We monitor body condition and make sure everything's looking good with their diet. You'll notice too, we feed them in uh, clear containers uh, when we remove them from their enclosure. As if you can imagine, uh, 
These guys usually uh, like to defecate immediately after they eat a meal. Uh, and the feces of an animal that uh, eats pretty much nothing but raw egg and poultry uh, is not a pleasant smell. Uh, and it's something that we like to be able to clean up immediately uh, instead of having to clean out their entire enclosure. Wow, yeah, for sure. So there's a question here. Folks want to know uh, the sex of the two Healy monsters. Are these males or females? Um, so one of them, I am relatively certain, is a female. Uh, morphologically, it's kind of hard to tell just by looking at them. Males tend to have a little bit of a wider head. Um, there's some things you can use, uh, like some sort of indicators if you're looking at the scales around the cloaca and things like that. Uh, but the dead giveaway is if someone lays eggs or if uh, somebody shows their hemipenes. The, uh, the best way to tell is to use an ultrasound um, to look for ovaries. But these guys, uh, just based on the way it looks, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly certain one of them is female, but we're we're not 100% certain. We haven't uh, we haven't checked with ultrasound. Speaking of sounds, do Gila monsters make any sounds? They do hiss uh, when they're threatened, uh, and they're they're generally unhappy. They'll kind of gape their mouth, and uh, they'll make a really loud uh, hiss as a threat display, uh, and. You can actually see, too, when they do that, the venom glands will start doing their job and their mouth will sort of fill up with their mouth goop uh, to kind of let you know they're ready to bite. Uh, everything's getting in place if they need to bite defensively. Um, they're pretty happy right now. They're, they're used to this. I don't think I'm going to get a hiss out of anybody. <laughs> sure, yeah. It looked like we were getting a big smile from our friend here enjoying these eggs, uh, which uh, another viewer wanted to know, what's, what are they eating right now? Um, so the, that's a uh, raw egg um, and uh, they're getting mice today. Uh, usually we would do, uh, we try to vary their diet as much as possible and also try to replicate the kind of things that they would get in the wild. Uh, so in the wild, they would eat a lot of, you know, quail eggs, ground nesting birds, like I said, um, small baby birds, straight up licking the bowl there, um, and maybe small rodents that they would come across. Uh, so those are the kind of things we tend to stick with, uh, and it's definitely the kind of things they like. They, uh, they are big fans of their egg, and they will, uh, they will absolutely lick these bowls clean. <laughs> it's so great to get such an up close look at them and i'm noticing you know carrie was telling us about the osteoderms the bony plates and the way that they're attached to their head is it that way across the whole body like are all of the bumps that i see on the neck and body are those all little bony plates yeah and so the genus that these guys are in um, Heloderma, uh, Gila monsters are Heloderma suspectum. Uh, Heloderma actually means domed skin. Uh, so it's kind of recognizing those like osteoderms that are all over their body. And those are pretty much, yeah, little bony plates that occur all throughout the skin that uh, afford them some protection from living in, you know, really rough environments. Uh, but they give them a really cool look too. And I can't remember if Carrie mentioned it when she was talking about the bone clones, but when you look at their skeleton, particularly in the skull, um, you can kind of see those osteoderms all fused to the skull. It's really difficult to sort of separate them out from the skull. <laughs> so compared to another reptile like an alligator that also has osteoderms, Right. The, the gators are embedded in the skin layer, but in this case, they're on the skull. 
Well, in the skull, yes, they sort of fuse to the skull. Um, throughout the body, I mean, they are essentially embedded in the skin, um, or they originate from the skin. They, okay. uh, so you, you could theoretically, if you look at the rest of the skeleton, you don't necessarily see them fuse to the skeleton, but in the skull, they do kind of uh, fuse to the skull, especially in the top. Gotcha. Oh, and he's just happy. <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to talk about too, and I'll take you away from those just a little bit and we can show some of our other animals. Uh, I don't want to go too far because I know Hila Derma are the topic of the day. <laughs> but then in general uh, is, like I said earlier, something that a lot of researchers are looking at to kind of understand the therapeutic value now. Um, one of the animals that actually gets a lot of bad press in North Carolina is the copperhead. And copperhead venom actually has specific elements in it that are, we're finding out, are very good at targeting specific types of cancer cells uh, because that's what a lot of uh, more hemotoxic venom that attacks connective tissue is designed to do is to seek out and destroy certain types of cell tissue. Uh, so there's a lot of really cool research going on right now uh, with copperheads in particular. Uh, and they're an animal that, you know, people really love to hate in North Carolina, but the more and more we're finding out that a lot of these things uh, have a value to human medicine, which then goes into a discussion on, you know, preserving that value. So preserving the biodiversity of what we're seeing outdoors and in our environments is really important uh, for humans to make sure that we have that resource available for those discoveries in the future. Because some of these things, uh, it would be a shame if they went extinct before we were able to do that research and find out uh, kind of what secrets are there that can lead to future uh, therapeutic discoveries. Hey, buddy. I love that. This is a gorgeous animal. They, people people say I'm crazy, but I think they are one of the prettiest snakes in North Carolina. They, they can get all kinds of really pretty colors. They blend in so well with leaf litter. And they're just a well-adapted animal to so many different types of environments in North Carolina. They're, they're really a survivor species. If they can survive in your backyard just as well as they can survive in the mountains in the West and just as well as they can survive down by the coast. Uh, they're pretty much in every county in North Carolina, uh, which is why they get so much attention because if you're going to see a venomous snake in North Carolina, that's the one you're probably going to see. Thankfully, copperheads... Uh, <laughs> Copperhead envenomations in people uh, very rarely tend to be fatal. Uh, so there is a, a very good access to antivenin in North Carolina, Crofab, uh, which is actually produced from uh, animal venom, is the antivenin that you would get uh, if you were probably bitten by a copperhead in North Carolina. It's also the anti-venom uh, that they would give one of us if we were bitten by any of the other pit vipers that we have here. Uh, so because they're so common, uh, that anti-venom is very readily available in North Carolina, thankfully. The problem is it's expensive. Uh, so you still should not pick up a copperhead as that would be a very costly <laughs> hospital bill. Uh, and the snake just won't appreciate it. Not to mention it. painful. Indeed. And this is our snake uh, on display. So this particular snake can be visited by the public. <laughs> We're showing the back of the display right now. Excellent. Thank you. 
So some questions that came in uh, about the Gila monsters, but I'm curious to know them about some of the venomous snakes too, like the copperhead. What is the conservation status of Gila monsters? You uh, indicated for the copperheads, they seem to be doing okay, but we should probably be keeping an eye on them. Right, um, and a lot of our other venomous snakes are not doing that well in North Carolina. Um, of the venomous snakes that we have in North Carolina, uh, at least four are threatened enough to have some sort of state conservation status. Uh, all of our rattlesnakes are uh, not doing that great in the wild. Our uh, Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake that you can also see on exhibit uh, here at the museum is an animal that's very dependent on a certain kind of habitat uh, that occupies burned out stump holes. Uh, and as that habitat becomes less common in North Carolina due to development, uh, that animal is slowly moving towards extirpation um, or just not being here anymore. The Gila monster, that is a uh, that is a very heavily protected animal in the wild. Uh, they are endangered. They and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one reason is they were just very heavily collected for the pet trade because they're so pretty and so cool. And um, they're also, I saw a question earlier, I think from Hugo about how fast they are. They're not really good mm -hmm. at getting away from you. Uh, so they were also very easily collected, which didn't do them any favors. Um, they are also as, you know, their habitat becomes more and more developed, uh, subject to some road mortality. Um, they do get run over, unfortunately, just as cars and uh, roads become uh, more and more numerous. And just losing their habitat. Uh, same as with some of our uh, snakes here in North Carolina, as their native habitat becomes more developed, uh, they start to disappear. Uh, and one of the biggest uh, issues that they're facing too uh, right now is people relocating them just due to fear. Uh, if somebody encountered these in a housing development or building a new house out in Arizona, they know they're venomous. They don't necessarily want them in their backyard, even though you saw me pick it up earlier uh, with proper uh, education, uh, we can you know, peacefully coexist with these guys. But when relocated, uh, they tend to beeline it right back for where they were. Uh, they do not really like being relocated to a different area. And like I said before, this is an animal that puts a lot into storing energy and conserving energy because of the place it lives. So making it back to where it was uses up a lot of that energy and could really uh, affect its chances for survival in that kind of habitat. Good to know, good stuff to know. Right. So don't pick one, one up. One of our viewers has a, so yeah, don't pick one up. Coexist peacefully. Uh, one of our viewers says they read that copperheads can coil and slither at the same time. Can you shed any light on this? So, snakes are, they are very good at movement. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. is, uh, so what I think they're talking about is snakes are able to, uh, as well as moving very quickly in a straight line when they're extended, to sort of side straight Would you almost like me to when show they're. Your hands? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. I don't know if I can even do it, but they can be partially coiled and kind of move at the same time. Um, I wouldn't say that you know a completely coiled copperhead when it's in that like coiled up resting or defensive position can really move well when it's in that position. Uh, but snakes are surprisingly fast, a lot of our native snakes, uh, especially when they feel threatened, like they want to get away from you as quickly as possible. Uh, and a lot of our snakes in North Carolina are actually very good swimmers too. All snakes can swim, 
not all snakes can swim great, uh, but some snakes like our, uh, our native Nerodia, we have a, a, a lot of water snakes in North Carolina that are obviously very good swimmers. Uh, and our cottonmouths that we have in North Carolina are very, very good swimmers and will eat a lot of fish and frogs and toads and things like that. You're just stepping in your food. Yeah, I'll show you the... That's <laughs> Decided to throw all of the mice out of the bowl. So... So you get to the egg a little better. Since we're talking about heloderma too, um, we may as well show some of their cousins that we see back here at the museum. So those are heloderma suspectum, which is the hela monster, um, which is primarily a uh, found in the United States. What we also have here is the beaded lizard. Um, it is found um, more southern uh, into uh, Central and South America. They're a little bit bigger. They are a little bit um, more arboreal. They're much better climbers. Uh, these guys are more uh, fossorial, meaning they dig more, they spend more time on the ground. Uh, they don't really excavate their own burrows that much. They like to find like small sort of crevices to put themselves in. Uh, these guys, the beaver lizards, uh, they'll spend a lot more time in trees, and they're a much better climber. And you'll see uh, when I pick one of them up, they're also a little bit more wiggly. So I'm going to use uh, some tools for them. So these guys, a little bit larger, um, but you can see they have those same osteoderms. Um, they're maybe even a little bit more pronounced on the head. And they were asking about sounds before. I don't know if you can hear that hiss. Let me see if I can get them. Yeah, He's moving around yeah I'm, I'm having a hard time making it out, but. Problem is, I have to keep my hands safe. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> there we go. So these two we actually do know are male and female um, because they have produced babies. Uh, that we have here at the museum. Um, I wouldn't really call them babies anymore. Uh, they're a little bit uh, too old for that now. Uh, we will call them juveniles, uh, but they are surprisingly cute. You can actually come out a little bit. So to, to get back to the original topic too and talk about venoms, um, when I said venom is very complex um, and there's a lot of variability, um, we're even finding now uh, that venom can be different within a species, individual to individual, locality to locality, um, or even very depending on diet uh, with the, the structure and the ratios of different elements in the venom. Uh, so a heloderma from uh, one locality might actually have a slightly different uh, venom profile than a heloderma from another locality. Uh, same with some of our venomous snakes. There's a baby. Like I said, they grow pretty quick, so I wouldn't really say he's a baby anymore, but they, uh, these ones, if we want to hear the hiss, they are a little bit more vocal than the adults. And these so, are also beaded lizards. Nope. Nope. Maybe super chill. Yeah, he's going to make me a liar. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but that is a very uh, important thing that goes into responding to envenomation as 
Same as with a bee sting. If a bee stung me, it might have a very different effect on me and my body than the way it might have on, say, Shauna. Uh, she might be deathly allergic to it and have to immediately go to the hospital because her throat closes up because that's the way her body responded to that venom. Whereas with me, um, my body might respond to it very differently, um, maybe just because I'm a little bit larger. Maybe because uh, my body is just more uh, more equipped to deal with it. Uh, so that's something that really goes into the medical treatment of responding to envenomation because we don't necessarily know how any one individual is going to respond to venom. Oh, he's eating his mouse. <laughs> I'll show you guys. Somebody did have a question about how they eat the mice, and we have someone who would like to show you. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> that doesn't look like bite sized pieces. No, like Kurt said, they are really good at consuming large meals. It also gives them a little bit of something to do. This can be a little enriching for them as well. Give them a task. I think in this case, I know, it, it looks like a lot of work. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kurt. I cut off what you were saying. <laughs> oh, I was just saying they they really like making a huge mess. Yeah. That's their enrichment. He's painting the egg all over <laughs> with the mouse. <laughs> So while we're watching him paint, do we have any other questions? We do. And actually, we were seeing a lot of this behavior, all of the tongue flicking. Uh, one of our viewers was asking if they smell with their tongue or with their nose. Um, so they're very similar to snakes. Um, you could kind of see when they were flicking, they have that forked tongue, um, the same way a lot of snakes do, uh, that picks up particles in their environment and uh, contacts with a Jacobson's organ on the top of their uh, mouth, very similar to snakes. Uh, so they are using that tongue in a sensory fashion the same way uh, snakes do. And you can see they that forked tongue, um, they, they can use that to pick things up sort of directionally and uh, tell which direction things are coming from. Oh, so if a, if a smell or I guess a taste comes in on the left fork of their tongue, their brain knows which way to go. Yes. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Kind of like rabbit ears on an antenna, if anybody is old enough to remember antennas. <laughs> yeah, once they start on those mice, they do go down pretty quickly. <laughs> we saw, I saw in the chat somebody saying that they eat fast and... Mm -hmm. Right, they have a surprisingly strong bite, uh, but strangely enough, they don't do a lot of chewing. <laughs> they, they sort of swallow their food uh, whole and fast, kind of like a duck. <laughs> and then they lick their lips. Yep. <laughs> now, you know, I noticed a behavior earlier when they were eating the egg that they would seem to get a lot in their mouth and then prop their body up so that their head was higher up above the rest. Was that to help move everything down into their digestive system? What... What were they doing? Yeah, I, don't see it I here, think that's just them taking advantage of gravity, uh, <laughs> eating kind yeah. of fast and uh, letting gravity do most of the work. Um, which is also, they're, they're eating, I mean, with the mouse you saw, they're eating fairly large food items. And they're, they don't really use their hands. Uh, they can't, you know, push food into their mouths. They got to kind of take advantage of gravity. This one's going to step in his food, too. <laughs> <laughs> and one of our viewers is asking uh, if they have 
teeth. I mean, you mentioned that they have the grooved teeth that help distribute their venom, but what about the rest of their mouth? They do. So they have uh, curved teeth on the top and the bottom. Uh, they're, uh, they're fairly sharp, um, and only some of the teeth are curved for ven or sorry, grooved for venom delivery. Uh, but another benefit of that is when they are grabbing small prey, um, when they're raiding nests and things like that, those grooved teeth are really good at holding on to prey that's struggling. Uh, so it's going to prevent things from escaping when they're, I guess, uh, to, it's a little gruesome, but when they're um, eating a bunch of babies in a nest, it keeps them from getting away. You got to have the right tools for the job. Yes, indeed. And these guys have a lot of tools that help them uh, survive in a very, very difficult place to survive. Uh, one of the other cool things uh, that they can use too for uh, survival is uh, when they're born, uh, a lot of animals when they hatch out of the egg uh, or a lot of reptiles when they hatch out of the egg, the babies come right out and uh, they go into the world. These guys, uh, babies typically hatch um, kind of around like October-ish, which is not a great time to find food. Uh, so a lot of times babies will stay in the nest after they hatch for a very long time. Uh, on into spring when food is more available uh, and kind of continue to subsist off the yolk from the egg during that time, which is not something you typically see in, in lizards. He's moving. <laughs> Very interesting. He just nudged his dish out of the way so he can get to that next mouse. We're on the prowl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're not the most capable hunters, so it's it's good for them that they can subsist off of very few meals. But this has been an exciting look at some of these animals. A couple more questions for you. Where do they get water? They live in a desert. Right. Um, so like I said, they're very good at absorbing moisture um, in very dry times. And they're also very good at getting moisture from their food. They really don't need to drink that much. Um, the beaded lizards, we see them, you know, drink from their water maybe a little bit more. Um, but these guys, they kind of just soak periodically. Um, they'll take in a little bit of water and they get most of what they need from eating eggs and kind of retaining some of the moisture in the food that they consume. Uh, and you see that in a lot of desert reptiles. Uh, one of the other uh, non-venomous species we uh, have kept at the museum, uh, the Euromastix, uh, almost never needs to consume water. Uh, it gets most of it from vegetation that it might eat. Uh, so that's a very uh, beneficial strategy uh, when you live in a desert to be able to get moisture from, uh, from sources that are a little bit more reliable uh, than precipitation and to be able to hold on to it for a long amount of time and get by without it. And it looks like our last mouse is on its way down the hatch. <laughs> Just in time too, as we near the end of our program today. Totally intentional, we timed it that way. Well, I mean, it kind of worked out. You said at the very beginning, it takes about half an hour for these animals to eat their meals. And I think you were right on it. So Kurt and Shauna, thanks so much for giving us this great behind the scenes look at the museum and at the Gila monsters. No problem. Thank you for coming, everybody. 
So, <laughs> thanks, Shauna. Great job with the camera. <laughs> Kurt, it was... <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks so much for, uh, for doing the good work of taking care of all of the animals that you do at the Museum of Natural Sciences and for bringing them to us in all of the great educational ways that you do. It's so great to have you folks as a resource at the museum because you know so much about the animals, even beyond just what it takes to care for them. You're experts at all aspects uh, of what it means to, uh, to take care of the animals and knowing about them. So I think that is so very important and I'm glad we've got you on the team. Thanks, sir. So everybody, <laughs> thanks for tuning in to this program, part of the Triangle SciTech Expo. We've got more programs today and tomorrow. So make sure you visit naturalsciences.org. Click on the link for the Triangle SciTech Expo in order to catch more programs. And you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel, click the bell to get notified. And then, hey, every program that we're bringing you, whether it's SciTech Expo or not, you'll get the notification and you'll know to come and join us right here for more great science stuff. I hope that we'll see you again in another SciTech Expo program. Until then, take care and stay safe, everybody, and have a great Friday. Bye, everybody. Bye.